Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Mo Show Live. Hey, it's Morris Lilienthal. Man, I am super pumped about today's guest. I've really been looking forward to, to speaking to today's guest, Nick Natton. Um, Nick is a 22-time Emmy Award-winning director, producer, author, songwriter, and podcaster, and, and dad and spouse, and, and, and the list goes on and on. And by the way, he happens to be a lawyer, too. Um, and he has created over 60 films, an award-winning, sold-out Broadway show. Folks, he's worked with some of the biggest names out there in business and sports, uh, just to name a few. He's got a recent uh, documentary and film that's been out that I want to. We're going to talk about a little bit from Dick Vitale on, on Dickie V. That uh, those who love sports, really, if you haven't seen that, you're going to love it. Um, Larry King, Tony Robbins, Richard Branson, Mark Cuban, Steve Forbes, just to name a few. So pretty amazing, and so thankful for him to take time for my podcast. Nick, how are you doing? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me on. Man, it's super awesome. Uh, folks, if you're watching the live show, you got questions or comments, let us know. We'll bring them up and try to get to them. If you're watching or we're seeing the uh, recorded broadcast, put them in the comments or feeds. We'll try to monitor that afterwards and get some feedback for anybody who's got questions. Um, over the years, Nick, you know, to kind of give folks just kind of a quick thumbnail sketch of what you've, some of the films that you've done. As I mentioned, you just did one on, with ESPN on Dick Vitale. You've done one of what's called Folds of Honor. I was seeing some research on that where it's a, Sounds like a great organization that that takes care of our military families and either, either fall in or someone who's been disabled. And, and I'm in Huntsville, Nick, and we have a huge military presence here yeah. with Redstone Arsenal. Um, we've got a, a really documentary series that I know my wife is a public school teacher would, would really want to we're going to check out. It's called The Truth About Reading. It looks about the reading crisis in America. Um, it's happening right here. And I've had some friends that have talked about this before with me in the FBI talking about human trafficking. And that's a really big issue. And one on Rudy Rediger uh, that everybody probably knows the, the, the movie, but you've done an, just a, another document on that. So just to give people a, an idea of what you've been working on over the years since you got out of law school down in Florida, where does the inspiration and passion from, from these stories come from? How, how do you decide that this is something that I want to highlight and focus and, and do a documentary on? You know, I, I wish the answer was more profound, but, uh, you know, I just try to find things I'm interested in. I mean, I think like probably a lot of people here that are listening, watching, whatever. I mean, I, I did well in school because it was expected of me and I, and I could, but I didn't like school. You know, I didn't like any of it. I mean, I didn't like elementary school, middle school, high school. I didn't like college. I didn't like undergrad. I didn't like law school. I just didn't. I mean, I liked the social aspects. Like I liked lunch and the other things that, you know, PE and stuff, but like, I was expected to, to go to school and, and, you know, to do well. Um, but I thought I hated learning quite frankly till a few years ago, because I just don't like being stuck at a desk for eight hours, being told what to do. That's not how I learn, but right. I've been blessed through doing documentaries to learn from the smartest people, the best in the world of what they do in the field. And that's fascinating. So really all I have done is, um, just chase things that I'm interested in. Like, so if I got asked to do a project the other day, and of course, I mean, look, documentaries is my passion is, and but it's also my business. Right. And so right. I got, I, I say yes to a lot because I mean, we, we got to run a business. Right. But I got something came across my desk the other day and just said, this just doesn't like, I have, like, I have, this feels to me like sitting in calculus. If I were to have to sit here for 12 hours and do interviews and I just, I'm not interested. So as my friend Joe Paul says, it's, it's either a, um, it's either a hell yes or it's a no. And so for me, I choose the subject based on typically yeah. people who I have relationships with and I'm, and I like them. Like, I'm like, Oh, I could spend the next couple of years with this person. But I also would, I would come out of it the other side, um, with some new ideas, some new skill sets, some new wisdom. And so I'm yeah. like interested, I'm fascinated, I'm interested. And, and it's people I want to spend more time with really. That's how I, how I look at it. Yeah. Well, I've got to imagine, and I just, I just ask you when you do a documentary, like some of the ones we just named, I mean, and I watched recently the, the one on Dick Vitale. I mean, there are interviews from people as young as when he's coaching, you know, in Detroit or wherever it was in the in the in the 70s when he's coaching. And you've got some students that were in his class in the eighth grade all the way up to modern day, all the personalities at ESPN. How, give us an idea of how much time and energy and, and work goes into putting together a document. And I'm sure it varies, but but give us some kind of idea. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll give you the sort of the process breakdown. And, and I stay in my lane really well. Like I'm really inept at most things. And so I direct and I produce and 
Um, I did not explain directing until a friend of mine helped me break it down the other day. And what directing really is just team building. It's just putting together the best team possible. And I am, I'm not great at a lot of things and I'm pretty good at a few. So I, I use the Jeff Bezos principle from Amazon, only hire people you admire. So I hire people I admire because they're so good at what they do and I can't do it. And then I just stay out of the way. But really the pro when, when I identify a project I, I want to do, I then identify, do I think I have enough friends who'd be interested in it and help me fund the thing? Um, or do I think I can sell it to a network? For instance, when I first did um, a documentary you might've just mentioned with a major network, I, when I first met, went to them, they had no interest at all. And I just went to said personality and said, let's just do it anyway. And they were like, great. And then I did it. And then about 75% of the way through, I got a phone call from the, the head of the network and they said, Hey, we messed up. What do we owe you now? That doesn't happen often. That was a great phone call to get, but, um, you know, that, but, uh, so, so I decide on a subject. I think I want to tell a story about, and I got to figure out how to fund it. Once I do that, I have a, I have a writing team, um, that comes in and my uh, Katie, my lead producer heads it up and she'll put together sort of a one sheet for us. Like I'll get them on zoom, whatever she'll do a bunch of research and like we'll present, you know, the, the parties I'm working with who, uh, so we can be on the same page. Cause I don't like adversarial situations. I'm certainly not going to spend my time working on a documentary for somebody who doesn't want to do it with me. So I'm like, Hey, here's, here's what we see the story being. Do we miss anything? And, or do you, or do we, or do we miss the whole boat? And then typically it's like, no, you got it all, but here's a couple of things. I didn't even think to tell you, you know, like, we, like with Dickie V, you should, I, I want you to interview Kenny Chesney, Charles Barkley, Shaq. And we're just writing at that point. Okay, great, great, great. And so, <laughs> and then we'll then turn it into like a full outline. A documentary outline is very different than a script because we don't know what people are going to say, but we typically, right. my writing and my writer and the research team will go back and see what people have said before about Dick Vitale in this instance or, or what we think they're going to say. And then we'll sort of piece together a story on paper. What I tell every single person I work with when I get into, um, right when we get to the outline, I say, here's the deal. The outline is the equivalent of a 2d ultrasound. Like we know we're having a baby, but if you ever had a baby, what you see in that ultrasound and what comes out are two very, very, very different things. Right. But the outline is really just intended to make sure we don't forget any really important people, places, things, or ideas. And as long as we don't forget them, they may not make the movie because it, it may just not, it may be too long, maybe too much, too many storylines. Right. But if we don't write them down and put them in, like, here's our plan. And like any business plan, it, it adjust based on the market and right. on the way. But then, then we basically start, you know, to use the sports term blocking and tackling. It's like, okay, from there, I know about how many interviews and how many locations we got to do. I will go, I more or less, because I run the team and the company, I'll decide what I want to go to, who I want to interview, or if it's one of my kids' birthdays or something, I'm not going to go. If it's on a weekend, I'm not going to go. Uh, and so I'll decide that I'll, I'll send a team out to get the stuff I'm not going to get or that I can't get. I'll go out and get the rest myself. Um, typical shoot time, depending on what we're working on, um, like typically takes about six to nine months to, especially when you're working with celebrities to like get everything to fall into place to where like, mm -hmm. like I'm interviewing um, Chris Jenner in a few weeks. Right. And like, it just takes a while to get the schedule to work out. I'm going to go do it. I'm gonna bring it back. And so by, when you're coordinating with all these people, you start trying from the beginning and you just, so it, you know, most of my docs are probably, they give you was a lot because there's so many personal. That's probably 40 shoots, probably. So over the course of months, right, as to schedule in with Bayheim at Syracuse and Coach K and Calipari and Magic Johnson and Barkley, like you just and so you schedule it all out. Once I'm done, I basically just give the outline and all the footage. And by the way, I don't shoot anything. I got cinematographers for that. I don't edit anything. I don't. I don't light anything. Like I'm useless right. with that stuff. I mean, I can yeah. hold my own, but I'm not. As, I I admire them because they're way better than me, right? So right. I stay in my line, I do the interviews, and then I turn over all the footage and the outline to my editing team. And I have a, a team of six editors, but I have one lead editor who manages them all. And we've done so many docs together. And I, it's really interesting. I realized recently we this is not rocket science, but it 
I finally was able to articulate, but like we were raised similarly and we have similar core values. So like, but he has a different skill set than I do. So when I give him something, he turns back to me something that I would love because we have, we're coming from a similar place, which is interesting. Right. Um, but I typically don't. So I basically say, Hey, here is a slab of marble. Here's what I think we have. I, I'll walk through here. I really, there's some cool moments here. This is awesome interview. I remember this, some of this, this really stuck out to me. I might even say, man, this is a really cool line. You might want to open the movie with, but don't. And I say, here's a slab of Michelangelo. Carve me the statue of David. That's there. Carve me the statue that's in that marble. And all he'll just start editing. His editing process is about 10 hours a day, five days a week, 16, 16 weeks for a feature documentary. It's editing is a bear. Um, and yeah. He'll typically during the process, tell me, ask me, Hey, do you remember any? Cause he's got to look through it all. And, but Hey, do, I can't find something. Like, do you have something like this? And I'll be like, Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, Charles Barkley said this, or I think this happened and he'll go, Oh yeah, I found it. Okay, great. Right. Or I'll say, no, do you need that? And he'll say, man, that, that would be really good if we get that. So sometimes we'll go get one or two or three more things that we need and then he'll edit it. And then once he's done editing it, I'll look at it and approve it or make a couple edits. I'll typically like when I, when I did Dickie V's, I took it to his home and sat down and watched it with him, you know, to see his reaction to that with Larry King too. That was mind blowing to watch Larry King, watch his life flash before his eyes. Um, and, uh, then once we agree on that or we make a few edits, whatever, then it goes to, you know, uh, color sound and sort of effects stuff that you know, we don't do use a lot of like explosion effects or anything, but like graphics and like even things like you wouldn't think about it, but like, all the credits and the titles in a movie, like you have to design those. You don't just use Times New Roman and throw them up on the screen. So then we're gonna, you know, color and sound and some visual effects, you know, titles, graphics, stuff like that, and it's done. So I mean, I would say our typical documentary takes about a year. I mean, it takes about a year from start to finish. Yeah. Well, it's not surprising considering everything you're talking about and doing, and and it and it certainly takes a, 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 a I'm sure a tremendous team to put together the types of documentaries that you're putting out. Uh, and you obviously have something to be proud of with what your team's putting out and doing, especially if, uh, you know, these types of celebrities and these people with these great ideas and inspirational stories are allowing you to, to tell their story. Uh, because I'm sure there's others that, that would love to tell their story. And, and for whatever reason, they don't connect with that person uh, to do that. Yep. I guess one of the things that, that occurred to me is how do you how do you build that connection or bring out things that are maybe just a little different? In, in, a, in a subject or an audience. Let, let me give you a specific example that, that, that really struck me with, with the Dick Vitale um, documentary was, and that was, um, Nick, I was watching that and, and, and throughout the story you weave in, y'all weave in the, the, the eye injury that you had at a young age and how impactful that was. And not only was it impactful, it's, it's most people could imagine if you if you lost sight in one eye, you know, growing up, how cruel kids are and, and, and sports and school, the difficulties, especially in the 50s and 60s when he was growing up, how, how with medicine not being as far advanced as it is now, but how that really affected him when he was an adult. And, and later in the story, he talks about being at ESPN and already being on the on the on the air and and someone calling in to when his early in his career making fun or, or saying get him off because he's got this lazy eye kind of thing it, it really struck a chord with me and i'm probably sure it struck a chord with other visitor i mean other viewers because it was like we all have something like that whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally or something that that we struggle with that, that we continue to struggle with me my weight's probably one of those things and do but that really it built a connection with me because I knew a lot about Dick Vitale. I thought I did, and I learned a heck of a lot more. But I, but it really admired him even more for that. And, and of course, he's very emotional and just wears his emotion. But anyway, how do you tell that? How do you make that connection with the audience? You know, man, I, I think, look, there's a lot of editorial devices use their music and timing and imagery. Like there's a lot that happens there, like technically, but from just a, a practical standpoint, I mean, um, I just care. Right. So when I'm like, I'm, I want to have a conversation with you where like, and, and when someone like Dick Vitale or Larry King sits down with me to share their life story with me, knowing that the purpose of it is to like encapsulate it and share it with the world. First of all, there's a level of whether they realize it or not, there's a level of preparation their subconscious is doing to, because there's certain things they want to, set the record straight or get off their chest or just they're just there's things they want to get off their heart things they want to share things they want people to know and obviously mm -hmm. that that 
whole part of his life, his eye story, I mean, it still deeply affects him to this day. So obviously it's an important thing to him. And he uses it as a way to say, you know, essentially you don't know what other people are going through. Don't like, here's how mean people can be with things you don't think about when he was pitching as a little league pitcher, people would say, Oh, don't worry. He can't even see, he can't throw a straight pitch. Like that's bullying. Right. And so that affected him. And right. so, I just go there with him like, man, what, what did that feel like? Like, what is that, what, what's it like right. to be a, you know, recount me walking through a game when you're seven years old pitching and a parent is like making fun of your eye. Like, what's that like? And it, I just, cause I, I'm interested, like I'm interested in who you are and what is affecting your life. And I, right. it's really funny for like a long time. I wondered, like I had Larry, King, I've had many people say, you know, Nick, I've never said this on camera before, but I'm like, well, why are you telling me? Like, I'm not your best friend and the world's going to see this, but it's obviously something they want the world to know. And they feel, right. they feel comfortable. I would guess, you know, one of my skill sets is making people comfortable. And it's because I care. Like I'm not, I'm not here to do to do you dirty. You know, I'm here to like, I'm here to work with you and help you. Like I'm, I'm right. raised, you know, I have a great faith-based system and, you know, we can talk all about, you know, faith and Jesus and all those things, but like, you know, to me, life is a gift and, and relationships are a gift and I treat them that way. And so I think people can sense and they do based on our interaction. It's not, I don't meet them and then interview them. Typically it's like, you know, we've met, we've had some coffee. We, you know, I, I'm, I'm in my 10th interview with them and they like have been working with me for six or nine months and my team and they see that everyone's nice and everyone cares. Like there becomes a level of trust where it's like, okay, yeah, this, but Nick actually cares and he wants to know my real story. I'll Sure. Yeah. Well, you're building, you're building a relationship with, with, with your, um, with the, the person that you're highlighting and doing, they're doing the documentary on or doing no or, different or than any business. That better too. Yeah. No different than an interaction with a law firm client of yours. You know, people, you yeah. know, the best way you can let them know you care is by being responsive, by, you know, listening, by paying attention, by well, all the things. Right. And so it's, right. it's not rocket science at all, but I, I guess entertainment, has a bad rep and maybe deserve, maybe not. I don't know, but yeah, it's the same as every same other. With <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but I think that comes from, but for you to, to genuinely build a relationship with someone like that, to me, it's something that you, um, you do because you have a passion for whatever the topic or subject matter is or the person or, or the story yeah. or the mission of the organization, if you're doing like folds of honor kind of thing. So it, it, it to me, I don't think you could fake that because I think somebody like Larry King or uh, some of these organizations that you're telling the story on and do wouldn't open up to you if they thought there was some other angle to it. Totally true. And I'll say also like as a, as a technical skill, we could make something about lima beans that would probably make you cry. Like we just like, we know how, we know how it works. And I guess one of the things like to add value here, like every situation in life has stakes like some are high stakes, some are low stakes, but no matter mm -hmm. what, no matter what situation you're in, like, you know, to a fourth grade kid, a spelling test on Friday, that's going to get them ice cream if they do well, that's high stakes, right? Like looking, us looking back now, it's laughable, but that's stakes. Like if I take you back to my fourth grade, you know, I, I'll take you back to my spelling. I won the spelling bee in elementary school and I'm in the last, it's just down to me and this one girl, Sarah, and she's like the smartest girl in the school. And we're around the table, the principal's doing the words. It's just like 10 of us. It's in the principal's office and like everyone else is out sort of disinterested interested and it comes down to you know she messes up a word now it's my turn if i get this right i win the spelling bee and i'm in fourth grade and i've beaten all the fifth graders like that's it's a funny true story but it's like i just created stakes like because we because like if i can if i can make you put yourself in my shoes and feel those experiences because emotions are human so all i gotta do in any scenario is is make it human and then I can bring it, whether you've been in that exact situation or not, your body knows what it feels like, right? So okay. so we have devices we use that, again, we can make you cry in 90 seconds. I mean, you know, Pixar is great at that, like in some of their shorts. Yeah. If you ever seen that little short they have called Bow about the little mother and the dumpling, and it's like you just lose you lose your junk in three minutes, and you're like you're sobbing uncontrollably about a, a Asian dumpling, you know? But there are devices that allow you to do that. But I think yeah. when you add that in with like a genuinely great, story you create stakes and you care it's 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 been a working formula for us at least well that's amazing it really is folks if you're just joining us our guest today is nick natton he's a 22 time uh emmy award-winning director producer author and songwriter nick one of the things that that you do and and and, and that you're really doing through this is your storytelling and, and you're obviously a great storyteller 
And I guess, you know, I kind of was thinking about talking to you today. And, and I think a lot of us really, we're storytellers in different roles, right? Certainly I'm a storyteller as a trial lawyer, but but as a parent, I'm a storyteller. My wife is a school teacher, is a storyteller. As a business person, I'm a storyteller. What what would you say to anybody that wants to try to get better at telling stories or speaking to an audience? Because that's really what you're doing, just in a much more high, high resolution way. Uh, any tips for becoming a better storyteller? Yeah, I think... Um... <clears throat> Speak to one person, right? So figure out who, like if you're writing a book chapter or you're doing a podcast or you're doing a YouTube video, you're like, you got to like, you need to, you need to speak and, and as if you're connecting one-to-one, there are many devices like this, that hopefully people, when you look them in the eyes and you're speaking to them, they feel like you're connecting one-to-one with them, but it's a one-to-many technology, right? And Mm -hmm. since the printing press and other things, we've had those. So I would just say, you know, in any media or medium you're working with, you know, imagine you're speaking to one person and speak that emotionally that just like you're sitting down and have a cup of coffee with a friend who cared and you care back. Right. And then the other thing is just, you know, I don't think you learn how to tell great stories um, or I don't think you learn how to do many things in life and be great at them without sucking first. Right. And so, and the only way to unsuck is to do it a lot more, right? Yeah. Like as a songwriter, you know, people send me music all the time. They're so excited about it. And I'll say, do you want me to, you want me to encourage you or you want me to tell you the truth? Or you want me to do both. And, and hopefully they want me to do both. And it's like, well, look, you know, you got some talent. This is look, first of all, you did it. Number two, let me ask you a question. If, if over the next 20 years you wrote songs every day, and if this was the best song you ever wrote, would you be 20 years from now, would you be motivated or depressed? And they're like, yeah, I guess I'd be depressed. If the, yeah. If the first one you did was the best one you ever did, right? You, why would you keep doing it? So the good news right. is it's not going to be the best one you've ever done. The good news is you're going to get better as you improve. And every look, if you do your job well, just like in, in life, if you grow, you look back at yourself in two, three years ago and you cringe a little bit. It's like, ah, oh, right. I'm so I'm so much more now than I was then because I've right. grown, I've learned, I've and that's what it right. should be with any creative pursuit, too. So I think with storytelling, it's no different. You're gonna start first story you tell is probably gonna suck. But by the way, as you test stories with one people or a small group or whatever, you'll learn what works. You'll learn the devices that work. You'll learn the parts people think are funny that you didn't think was funny. They'll just laugh. You'll learn that. So it's all about doing it, practicing it. But of course, again, there's many places you can go to learn sort of the mechanics of how to tell a story. Just again, to add value very quickly, the best way to tell a story is to, is to start with what they call a cold open. So it's sort of like, you know, um, I, you know, so there I am in the middle of the night driving in down a road. There's the only thing behind me is a motorcycle gang in front of me is a cliff. There's no way to turn left or right. And you know, and I got to make a decision. So how did I get there? And then you, it's like, I'm going to insert you in the middle of a scenario that you're like, Oh, this is fascinating. I don't, I wonder what's going to happen. Yeah. And then you earn my attention and then you get the right to divert it and then tell me how we got there. And so, you know, that's, there's many different ways, but that's, that's one method. Well, I love that. And, and just from a practical standpoint, I think we all we all lose sight sometimes of that, that when we start something like this or becoming a short and speaking to other people, maybe not to your family directly, but but in crowds or doing anything else or to strangers, it's scary for a lot of people. And and you are going to suck at it. I mean, I, I can I would like to think that I would do a better job now in, in a jury trial than I would have done 20 years ago sure. taking the deposition. But but I think some of it is is just putting yourself out there and doing. I know for as a parent for me that is something that that um, I've tried to work with my son on and do as he's now thirteen and now seeing him have communications with with individuals and strangers and he can start a communication and talk to just about anybody about any subject was not something at seven or eight years old he wanted to do. But yep. I kind of gently pushed him and told him it's okay, just talk and open up and and do. But I love that. Just great stuff. Wanted to kind of, as we get towards the end end here, uh, Nick, wanted to just touch on what you just, you kind of led right into, which was songwriting. Uh, you know, I know uh, that I read that your music has kind of been, was maybe your first big passion in doing and, and that you've been a very successful songwriter. Uh, saw that where, you know, Darius Rucker, you've worked with Darius Rucker, you've worked with Lee Bryce, and I think you've had, and number may be wrong, but I read somewhere over 3 million downloads on some of the streaming services and things. Um, we talked about, you know, kind of finding something that's your passion for films, but I've never really, you know, 
talk to anybody about who's been a successful songwriter. I'm curious, how does that work? I mean, do you just have, are you literally riding down the road and you see something and that's the inspiration sometimes, or is it, are you working with an artist and there's certain things that you're trying to write a song towards or how does it all the above? I mean, so you, I'd say from a practical standpoint, you know, I keep a note of things that I think would make good songs or good titles or good lines or whatever. You just sort of, you, the coolest part about it is it teaches you to be really observant of the world around you because essentially so, and again, I'm not that smart, so I didn't connect these things for a long time, but you know, songwriting is, is really just a form of storytelling. And I, I think it's one of the hardest ones because you got to make someone laugh, cry, feel something in two and a half to three minutes. And you get really two verses of about four lines. That's like eight lines. So like two paragraphs, um, if that, and you know, the chorus is typically repeated. That's maybe four lines. So that's like 12 lines and then maybe a bridge. So maybe 14 lines to make some and two and a half minutes to make someone like to insert them directly in a situation and make them feel some way about it. Right. And right. so, um, so I think the cool part about it is it does make you observant in a different way trying to, cause you know, great songs will have a title. And then by the time you get to the end of the chorus, you realize sort of it's called a flip like oh my god I, I didn't see that coming at all wow that's cool um and so you know it, it's all the above from a practical standpoint like i started out writing songs by myself in my bedroom as a teenager as i got more into working with professionals um before covid it was all in person nobody would do it on zoom now there's a lot of zoom song rights which is great um but we'll go in we'll go in with either a goal of like i got this thing i gotta get out of my head um i got something there's something cultural or you know, in my life that's happening or something that's happened to everybody. Let's write to that. Or yeah. I mean, your favorite song, right? Is when you got an artist who's working on a record and you're like, what do you, what do you need to talk about? What do you not have for your record yet? Let's talk about that. And then oh, let's wow. write to that. So it could be anything, but typically um, when, you know, pro writers for the most part, and I, I've never written in LA, just really Nashville country rock pop stuff. Okay. Um, Two writes a day is typical. So like it uh, depends on how late you were up the night before, but typically like 11-ish is the start of the first write, and you're usually done by two-ish, uh, two or three, and you do another write at maybe four or five until seven or eight. And, and you, so, so you typically finish a song, all music, all lyrics, everything in three to four hours, and you'll do two a day. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And so if you're writing a song, do you do you have – if you do it on your own and you're not working directly with an artist – is that something then you just and, and you do you go pitch it to uh, a record label or do you pitch it to a certain you have a, or do you have sometimes have a certain artist that you think might be a, a good fit for that song? Yeah, so there's I mean there's no there's no right answer, but there's what happens more often than not. So songwriters make more money. Well, an artist makes more money on their own record if they're a writer on their songs. And Mm -hmm. also most people find it more personal, like, but the coolest thing, like the biggest art, a lot of the biggest artists in the world, especially we'll talk about country, like George Strait's never written a song in his life. Blake Shelton does not write songs. Kenny Chesney does, but he cuts a lot of what's called outside songs. Art, so does Lee Bryce. They're just looking for the best song, but uh, you know, but Lee Bryce writing a lot of songs they are personal to him. He thinks, you know, on a, album which they're rare these days but like probably nine out of 12 songs probably lee bryce wrote and by the way lee's written hits for other people too and so right. so he's a great writer and and he started out as a writer and so he's a great writer so but he'll cut outside songs because he's like oh that's <laughs> that's a great song i'll cut that so so the best way would be writing with the artist the second best way is if you have a personal relationship with the artist and you go i know you're cutting right now and i heard you're looking for an up tempo or a ballad or a wedding whatever it is check this out and they'll be like if they don't they never tell you no. You just won't hear back from them. You just won't get a response on the text. Um, <laughs> if they love the like, ooh, like Kenny Chesney texted me back and was like, man, I, my record's done, but I love this song. Let me think about it. Like, oh, so close. Come on. But he'll probably never think about it again. But anyway, um, <laughs> that might have just been a nice no. Who knows? But, but, um, and so, but then, or a lot of times your publishing company will, if you're signed to a publisher, they'll have song pluggers and they're always meeting with labels, bringing songs, sending songs, or you can hire an independent song plugger. But, most of the people I know who are successful in that business have a support team around them, but their, their personal relationships with the artist is what gets mm. the songs cut. Yeah. 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 Man, Nick, thank you so much for taking time today and doing, this has just been a true honor and really great uh, getting some of the inside story of, of your film uh, journey and career and, and how you put these kind of documentaries together and, and, and sharing those insights with us. Um, Nick, if people want to connect with you and, and learn more about what you're doing and follow you, it's the best place to go to your website, probably. 
Yeah, yeah, you can go to nicknanton.com. We're pretty much on every social. Thankfully, there's, my name is not common, so it's probably me if you find Nick Nanton. Yeah. Well, folks, I, please check these out. He's got a lot of great documentaries out there, and if you go to nicknanton.com or follow him on social media, you're going to be able to keep up with the latest things that are going on in uh, his professional career and, and follow those films and documentaries that are out there and, and certainly check out some of the music as well. Nick, thank you so much for your time today. Take care. Thanks for having me, man. Take care. Bye-bye.